This has been a really fun module so far, and I hope you're enjoying it as well. But all good things must end, and so this is the final video for this module. So, so far in this module, we've extracted two kinds of features from the EEG data, the SSVEP and alpha oscillations. And we are now going to test whether these two features are related to each other. There are several ways that we could look for relationships between these two effects. And what we are going to do is look for correlations over space. So in these scatter plots, each dot corresponds to a single electrode, a single data channel. And then we've correlated the 20 hertz SSVEP power that you see on the y-axis with the raw alpha power that you see on the x-axis. And then in the title, I have the Pearson correlation coefficient. So you can also see that I'm using non-default settings for the markers. So this effect comes from partial transparency, and we are going to figure out how to do that in MATLAB. So this is the, the main goal for this video. We generate these two scatter plots showing the correlation between raw alpha power and 20 hertz SSVP power and task related alpha power in this plot and the same 20 hertz SSVP power. So this y-axis is the same as this y-axis and these x-axes are different. All right, now it's time to switch to MATLAB and start coding. We have already created all the data that we need to use in this video. However, it is sometimes useful to create new variables for convenience from other variables. So here I have this relatively long line of code here that says the channel power for all the channels and we want from this frequency to this frequency and then we're averaging over frequencies and so on. This is a pretty long line of code. So I'm just going to call it all X. So I'm just gonna say X equals and then all of this stuff. So now, for the rest of the code in this video, I can just work with this variable x instead of having to use all of this inside the plotting code and the correlation code and so on. Okay, so that is x and then here we have y and the y axis variable is also coming from all channel, pow channel power. So it's exactly the same variable. We're just selecting a different frequency. Here we have a range of frequencies from eight to 12 Hertz. And here we just have one frequency at 20 Hertz. Okay, so we get these two variables here. And now we're gonna create a scatter plot. So we start by writing X comma Y. That's pretty sensible. Let's see how that looks. Now that looks fine, except that the figure that I showed in the slides looks a little bit fancier. So let's add some additional inputs here. First, I'm going to change the size of the markers by adding a third input. So we want the size. I'm actually not totally sure what units these correspond to, but uh, you can see the larger the number, the bigger they are. So we can try a thousand. That's probably cartoonishly big. Uh, but you know, I, I happen to like uh, 120 for this particular data set. I, I played around with a few different numbers and I found that this value 120 seems to look pretty good. Okay, so these are blue circles. I wanna specify that they should be red circles. So now I'm gonna add R, O. This is not the number zero, this is the letter O. So the red, uh, or the R is for red and the O is for a circle. Okay, so this is looking better. We're get, it's getting a bit closer. Now the, there's no marker face. You can see this looks like a thicker circle, but actually this is two dots that are almost perfectly overlapping. And here we have a bunch of dots that are partially overlapping. So we want to add a marker face, face color, and that's also going to be red. So run that line of code again. Now we're getting closer, except I showed some partial transparency in here. So it turns out that the transparency of the marker face is given by the property that is called marker face alpha. So whenever you see, whenever you're doing image processing and you see something about alpha, that's telling you about the transparency. A little confusing, of course, because we're working with alpha oscillations, but this is alpha for transparency and image processing. So uh, alpha is a parameter that varies between zero and one. We can see what happens when we set it to zero. There we get exactly what we got before. So this is an invisible marker face. 
And of course, if we set it to 1, then it's going to be what we had the previous time when we left this out. And this tells us that when we specify a marker face color, then the default alpha value is 1. Okay, so let's try some other values. How about 0.5? Let's see what that looks like. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere. You can see it's now partially transparent. Some of these circles look darker because that's multiple data points overlapping. So the value that I used was 0.2. So there you go. Of course, I encourage you to spend some time playing around with this line of code with these optional inputs and see if you can find something, you know, a different color scheme and transparency and marker scheme that you think looks a little bit nicer or at least somewhat different. Okay, so this is most of the plot. We still need to add a title. Now the title shows the correlation coefficient. So I'm going to use the function core coef and we want to compute the correlation coefficient between our two variables, x and y. So x comma y. Now already, we haven't even finished going through this code yet, but you can already see the advantage of setting these smaller uh, variables instead of having to, you know, otherwise we would have to have this long variable in here and also in here. And now the code is starting to look a little bit unruly. It's getting more difficult to read, potentially more confusing and more opportunities for making mistakes. So that's why this is generally a good idea when you're doing coding. Okay, so let's see, here we have the correlation coefficient between these two variables, and this actually returns a correlation matrix. Now, when you only have two variables, it's not really sensible to have a, a whole correlation matrix, you know, because each variable is obviously correlated with itself, one, and a two by two correlation matrix actually only has one unique value. Nonetheless, you can imagine that this is useful when you want to compute all the correlations between a data set of, you know, 10 or 50 or 2,000 different variables. Okay, so therefore, uh, we want to set the title to be R equals, and then this part seems correct, except that uh, we only want to input a single number here. So we can input the first row and the second column, and that's going to be one number. Very nice. So this is one of the two scatter plots, and we see that raw alpha power is strongly correlated, 0.82, strongly correlated with the 20 hertz SSVEP power. So that's pretty interesting. These are totally different frequencies. This one is endogenous, this one is stimulus driven, and they're pretty strongly correlated with each other. Okay, so now, uh, let's see. So now we want to run the same analysis, but for the task modulation of alpha. So that was coming from variable alpha post versus pre. So up here, we generated uh, x and y, or we set these variables to be x and y. So do we also need to do that here? Well, I'm also leaving out x here, and it says in the comment, x is short, so left out. Now, what does that mean here? Of course, the variable x is short, but actually I'm not referring to the variable itself, but the thing that the variable is being set to. So up here, we had to compute an average of data and we had to select for all channels and then do this frequency index. However, we've already done all the indexing and averaging that we need to do. So we only have this one little variable here. So therefore, I think it's not really necessary in this case to say x equals this thing because this thing is already pretty short on its own. Okay, so we do set y here, but you know, let's, let's also think about this for a moment. This variable y corresponds to what we're showing on the y-axis here, and this is exactly the same as what we've already computed up here. So we have exactly the same line of code, exactly the same right-hand side, exactly the same left-hand side, same variable, same everything, and it's in here twice. Now, on the one hand, that isn't really wrong, it's not incorrect, it's fine, but I think this is not really good coding style. And the reason is that this is just creating potential for confusion. And that's because if someone comes along and is looking through your code or you know, future versions of you when you come back and look at your, your old code that you haven't looked at in weeks or months or years, it might be a little bit confusing. Someone might look at this and say, huh, they are redefining exactly the same variable to be exactly the same thing. Maybe this is a typo, maybe this is supposed to be this. So you can see why having the same line of code in here redundantly is just creating the possibility for confusion. So therefore, 
I'm just going to get rid of it altogether. Okay, so then we create a scatter plot. All this looks fine. So here we have blue squares. The marker face color is blue and the face alpha is also 0.2. And this goes in a second subplot. And we can see that when we plot that, that actually erased the previous plot. So I think we're missing a line of code up here. I think this needs to say subplot one, two, one. So there you go. So we have subplot geometry of one row and two columns. And now we're going to plot into the first subplot. Okay, so that looks good. Yeah, and then we'll add the title again here. And then let's see, this is already looking good. So then we still need the title here. And I see that this is, this looks good. This is already done for us. Oops, no, I need to put this back in, ah, it went in the wrong uh, subplot. That was my mistake. Let's see, I'll go back and recreate all of this. Now, notice that the correlation values have a different, uh, a different level of precision in these two subplots. So here we have, after the decimal point, we have one, two, three, four, five digits after the decimal point. And here we have one, two, three digits after the decimal point. Now, the reason why that happens is I'm providing an optional second input into the num to string function. And this specifies how many numbers of precision we want to include when converting from the number into a string. So for example, we can write about nine. And let's see, so now the correlation, we got really precise correlation. I don't think we need that much information. How about one? Let's see what that looks like. Now it says minus 0.2. It's kind of okay, although in, in my opinion, one significant digit isn't really sufficient. So I, I'm pretty happy with two or three, I, I think is good. And of course you could do the same thing here. So it has some consistency between the two plots. And that is the end of this module on EEG spectral decomposition in MATLAB. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you feel like you learned something about EEG and also about MATLAB coding and data visualizations. Don't forget that there is a PDF in the online resources for this module that will give you some uh, additional exercises to work on if you want to continue working with these kinds of data.